all right come on you don't actually think that your teammates are the issue right like you don't genuinely believe that ranked is luck right most of you probably don't. I mean, I love to blame my teammates as much as the next guy, but like they can't really be the reason when so many people can climb consistently. But maybe you do believe it's luck, in which case the series is for you. This month, I'm going to be taking a journey, nay, a pilgrimage into the depths of hell to figure out what it really takes to climb in Valorant. I don't want an easy climb though. I've been playing in immortal level lobbies for far too long. If I just queue into a silver level lobby as chamber, I'm going to absolutely trash on everyone there. That would not be fair. We're not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to be playing Astra, one of the most demanding agents when it comes to team play. And what's that? Oh yeah, I also will have comms muted for this entire climb. Because you guys always say that your teammates don't listen to you. And if that's the case, I got to figure out what I would do to carry if my teammates didn't listen to me. The goal of the series is to show exactly how anyone can rank up out of the depths of hell all the way up to diamond by just applying the same fundamentals that we teach over at Skillcap. Many people believe that the tips that they hear from high elo players don't apply to them, and believe it or not, sometimes they're right. Playing in low elo demands an entirely different skill set, and just trying to mimic top tier players will only hold you back. That's why at Skillcap we teach the game from the low elo perspective to help players understand what it really is that they need to do to climb. The best part about the series though, since I couldn't communicate with my teammates, I instead decided to record every single game and walk viewers through my thought process during each match. Over on the website, you'll be able to find 30 plus games from a top immortal level player where I explain every single decision that I made and why I made it. You probably don't want to climb to diamond playing Astra, but that's okay because all of the fundamentals will still remain the same regardless of what agent you're playing. In fact, I guarantee we can help you improve, otherwise you'll get your money back. Don't believe we can help you? Call our bluff. Go check it out and see for yourself. First, I want to show you how important it is for you to be playing the game as perfectly as you can though. That sounds ridiculous, I know, like, haha ha, king, why would I ever make mistakes on purpose? But even when I say that, I'm sure some of you are smiling thinking, yeah, sometimes I do be doing a little bit of throwing. In the past, I've been really lenient on this sort of thing. Sometimes it's fun to chase after kills and ego swinging people, but after starting this climb, I'm going to double back on this viewpoint. If you've ever heard the saying, practice makes perfect, you're only actually hearing half the story. The phrase many pro players will echo is, it's not practice makes perfect, it's perfect practice makes perfect. If you really want to get better at the game, you have to cut out this sort of trolling stuff. Many games are decided by just one or two rounds, and if you deliberately make a decision that you know is a mistake just because you feel like it you're holding yourself back way more than you realize it's more than just one game it's not enough to know that you knew the correct decision you need to practice making these decisions otherwise it's likely that you'll make the same mistake in the future for example take a look at this round that i played during one of my gold level games if you look up at the score line you'll notice it's currently nine to four we're clearly doing great but after switching sides we actually lost the pistol round And the reason we do that is because it cuts off a lot of very important sight lines that a player can kind of like get information from. So we have the Spectre now, so we can definitely make work with this. I kind of want to follow the tools in. And notice we run and gun right there, make it more difficult for them to hit us. Player standing. One enemy remaining. Trinity, you're welcome. As you should know, losing the pistol round generally means that your team is on a save and will likely end up losing the second round if the enemy team buys up and plays intelligently. This means if everything goes according to plan for them, they should quickly close out this round and turn that 9-4 into a 9-5. All right, that doesn't sound that great still, but stick with me. If they don't lose a lot of players on this buy, they can actually keep most of their specters and take them into the next round, which would then be our buy round. Most players refer to this as a bonus round. Now, although a team isn't favored in a bonus round, if they do end up winning it, they will have a ton of extra credits, rifles, and this will put the score line at nine to six. Not only that, but we would also once again be on a save round and will likely result in another loss 
lost round for us, making the scoreline way closer than we'd like it to be. Valorant is a game of momentum, and by winning Pistol, you can easily snowball this win into four, even five rounds sometimes. But everything I just explained is just the optimal situation. The bottom line is, nothing is guaranteed, and if you fuck around too much, you might lose your advantage real quick. That's exactly what this raise learned the hard way when she wide swung our entire team with her Spectre. I say this raise learned the lesson the hard way, but the reality is she probably swung this angle, killed our chamber, and then went, I got mine after she got traded. What she fails to realize though is because she pushed up so far alone, she ended up giving me a Spectre on my save round. I didn't buy anything this round, like at all. I didn't even buy any stars, but now I've just been gifted a Spectre and you're about to see what I'm going to do with it. Immediately after getting this pick, if we're being conscious about normal positions during the pre-round, what we will likely expect is that there will be one more player on A, there'll probably be a player coming over from Boiler over towards screens to help, and this means that we will have a 4v2 on A site if we move quickly. Luckily for me, my Fade was using Util to help us scale up on site, and rather than just watching her do this like many players might do, I want to put my freshly gifted Spectre to work. So as soon as I see my Fade's Prowler go out, I follow up behind it and scale onto site. Because I'm expecting one player on site, I'm not too caught off guard when I find the Fade back site, and I take advantage of the running accuracy on the Spectre to help me secure this kill. But wait, I'm not done. As I'm planting the spike, I notice my teammates are falling quickly, so I'm trying to get a grasp on what is going on in the round. By listening for info, I'm able to quickly determine that I might have some sort of an opening to wrap around back site, so I quickly start to do so. As Sage rained down from the sky, I was able to pick her off with a decent flick, and then without skipping a beat, I immediately grab onto the rope and start going up into nest. A site icebox is easily one of my favorite sites in the game to be in clutch situations on, because there are so many different ways that a player can approach it. You can go up into nest like I did, or you can wrap around the front side of nest, or you can wrap around the back side of nest, or you could even go through maze. Some players might even consider staying screens or wrapping around towards rafters. There are so many options, but by using some deduction based on timings, a smart player can make sense of all of these options and accurately predict where their opponent is. By taking the zip line, I have effectively checked off one option. Raze is not going up into nest because I am there, so she must be doing something else. The best part about this though, is that I also can see towards the front of nest and I don't see Raze there either. Meaning that unless Rays went maze, which I felt was very unlikely given the circumstance, she had to be backsight wrapping around on me. Sure enough, I'm able to drop down and clear her out, turning around where I literally bought nothing into an amazing round win that essentially seals the game for us. Because as we said, winning pistol round is awesome, but if you lose the buy round after, you're back to square one. Now we have stolen the advantage. We have the guns, we have the credits, and they have to save now. And it's all because of one stupid play from the Rays. Not to say that there is nothing her team could have done after she died to win the round, but she definitely made it significantly harder for them to win, and that's why it's important that you are consistently making the best decisions that you can possibly make in your games. Because no round is a given, and at the end of the day, this kind of stuff doesn't just lose you rounds, it loses you games. Valorant is a video game, I get it. Sometimes you just want to have a little fun, and playing perfectly isn't always fun. However, if you want to rank up, you need to play as perfectly as you possibly can. This means if you know something is dangerous or a mistake, don't do it. That last clip was just one example of a good round throughout this series though. What I really want to make clear in this video is just how important one round can be. A lot of players believe for them to rank up, they need to be superhumans being able to clutch up every single round. I'm here to tell you that you really don't. You're going to have to clutch up sometimes, of course. That's part of the game, and if you're better than the rank that you're in, you probably should be able to clutch up in most 1v1s or even 1v2 scenarios. But by applying some fundamental rules, you'll be able to easily know how to clutch up even the worst of rounds. The first rule is quite simply, you heard it before, isolate your gunfights. You don't win 1v3s by dueling all three players at the same time. You win a 1v3 by taking three 1v1 gunfights. The second rule is also quite simple. If you're down in numbers, you need to take a duel. If you give the enemies too much time to group up, it's going to make it a lot more difficult for you to find 1v1 gunfights. This rule is best applied during fast moments in the game. For example, you'll notice during this round, quickly after my Reyna died, I was able to find a fight onto the enemy KO, who was swinging wide for no reason at all. If you give him too much time, maybe he eventually realizes that he's low HP and he shouldn't be doing this, which is also something that sets apart higher elo players from low elo players. A high elo player will get a 
kill and immediately know what the next step is. For low elo players, they may be able to figure out what the right decision is given time, but it will likely take them a moment to do so, and that's your best opportunity to catch them off guard. To showcase what I mean even further, you'll notice immediately after I kill this KO, the enemy team sets up a crossfire. This is the correct decision, and is exactly how you secure a 2v1. Remember our first rule? If I can't isolate my gunfights, it's going to be very hard for me to win the round. At this point, the round is seemingly theirs for the taking. Or is it? Recently, I was watching a video from our League channel where our content creator Hector talked about the idea of asking your opponents questions to see if they know the answer. These questions are asked by introducing threats to your opponents and seeing if they know how to correctly identify the threat and respond to it appropriately. 1v2s are a tough win, especially when the enemy set up a crossfire like I've heard my opponents doing here. But I still have one star available, so it's time to ask them a question. The question is, do they know what to do if I smoke off the crossfire and try to isolate a fight onto chamber? The answer is, as soon as Cypher sees this smoke go down, he needs to recognize what I'm doing and get ready to swing the smoke when I take contact with chamber. Chamber as well should likely recognize what is happening and try his best to stay alive until Cypher can swing with him. This means Chamber also needs to tuck closer into the corner to give time for Cypher to get close to the edge of the smoke so that he can swing off of him. However, this is not what happens. Once the smoke goes down, Chamber swings out wide before Cypher gets into position and Cypher was too slow to push into the smoke so he wasn't ready to trade out the kill. After Chamber dies, it's not a good idea for Cypher to swing out of the smoke so now the round slows down a bit. This brings us to our last rule for clutch which is patience is a virtue. This is something I've learned quite a bit over the last year and it's won me countless rounds. I can't express how important it is to be able to slow yourself down in these moments. Because although I've turned a 1v3 into a 1v1, I still need to close out this round. I knew that they were setting up a crossfire and although Cypher was too slow to swing the smoke, I still think it's very likely that he at least made some sort of effort. This means although the spike is currently in the smoke, I can't go in there and get it. It would just be too risky and honestly I don't need to take the risk anymore. I have plenty of time on the clock and the pressure's on him right now because in about 8 seconds that smoke is going to fade and at that point I could be anywhere. So I just wait. In the meantime I clear back sight real fast to make sure that he's not wrapping around on me and then after I see that he's not there it's pretty obvious where he is. Now although I whiffed my first few shots on him the thought process was all there and I just really wanted to demonstrate how winnable these rounds are if you just apply the things that we teach you in our videos. I'm not some superhuman player that just clutches up every Every single round, but so far on this climb I've averaged around one clutch a game and that's helped me win a majority of my matches. Which brings me to my final point for this climb, which is that some of you are shouldering way too much responsibility in your matches. In our last video I posted a screenshot of my match history through silver, and I match MVP'd pretty much every game. That kind of stuff didn't last in gold. I still played very well and pulled my weight, but there were quite literally some games where I just got carried. Not due to lack of effort or poor play really, just due to the fact that my teammates were hitting shots. We've talked about a theory before in our videos where we've said around 20% of your matches are guaranteed wins. Pretty much regardless of what you do, it's a one game. Maybe they have a lever, maybe you have a cracked teammate that carries you to victory. It would basically be impossible for you to lose. However, there is also an equal 20% of your games that are instant losses. No matter what you do, the game is unwinnable. You could play to the best of your abilities and it wouldn't matter. Maybe you have a lever, maybe the enemy team is the entire loud roster preparing for a tournament. Whatever reason, the game is unwinnable. That other 60% though is what you're fighting for. Those are the games that you can have an impact and actually be able to sway them in your favor. Going by this rule, you may think that I have an 80% win rate on this account, but that's not actually true because I don't play perfect all the time. Maybe a top Radiant player would be able to pull that off, but I'm just an average immortal player. Sometimes I miss shots, sometimes I make mistakes, and honestly, I'm still learning how to play no calm Astra in this elo. I'm currently sitting around 70% win rate, which means I still lose about once every three games. I'm saying this because I want you guys to recognize it's okay to lose. In fact, you're likely going to learn a lot more from your losses than your wins. Over the course of the series, you'll see how I learn from my losses and discover the real secret to climbing in low elo. If you want the full value from the series though, I highly recommend you check out our brand new course on the website. There you will find over 30 commentaries where I walk you guys through every single game that I play on this climb and teach you everything there is to know about climbing in low elo. As we mentioned earlier, it's all backed by our rank improvement guarantee, so you can be sure that you'll actually gain rank from using our service. It is possible for you to hit those higher ranks. All you've got to do is apply the right methods and you'll skyrocket to success. That's going to do it for this video. As always, my name is King and we here at Skillcapped want to thank you all for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.